There's more mischief, mayhem, and nefarious goings-on in the city of brotherly love than Billy Penn could have ever imagined. We've got it all here on the Twisted Philly Podcast. True crime, haunted history, the coolest and creepiest places to visit. Welcome, Welcome to, to Twisted, Twisted Philly. Philly. Hey, Twisters, what up? Welcome to a special Crime Con episode of Twisted Philly. I'm your host, Dina Marie. I have to apologize. I said I would get a mini Crime Con episode up while I was at Crime Con, and obviously that didn't happen. I also said my next regular Twisted Philly episode would be up by now, and that didn't happen either. We had some incredibly long days and long nights in Indy, and when I say long nights... I should clarify because most of my long nights ended around 11, which for me is actually rather late. I know I'm a complete loser, but at home I'm in bed by 9, unless I'm staying up late to work on Twisted Philly, and I'm usually up by 5 in the morning for my commute to work, so staying out till 2 or 3 is simply something I couldn't do. I just couldn't hang. Except for Thursday night, when two of my best buds, Mike from Pleasing Terrors and Jeremy from Podcasts We Listen To, kept me out till almost 3 a.m. They are clearly bad influences on me. So as I said, I'm about a week behind. For this episode, let's talk Crime Con. It might not be for the faint of heart, but if you ever wanted to see the inside of a crime scene, Crime Con might be for you. From those crime scenes to how police investigations work to the story behind making a murderer, the first crime con is already a huge hit. As you all know, Twisted Philly is not all true crime, but I jumped on the true crime bandwagon back in September when most podcasts jumped on board. Long before the event had big-name speakers like Nancy Grace and Josh Mankiewicz, am I making a point right now? You bet your sweet ass I am. In my opinion, it was the podcasters that drew the listeners who bought the tickets way back when, and not necessarily my show. Big name shows like Gen Y and Thinking Sideways and the girls from Insight, Allie and Charlie. But big or small, the concept of if you build it, they will come was initially based on podcasts. That's the power of this medium, and that's the commitment from all of you, and it is fucking incredible. Did you notice I just said fuck? Yeah, I do that sometimes. On the flight home, I thought about how I would share my crime con experience with all of you, including my interview with Carl Marino, who plays Lieutenant Joe Kenda from Homicide Hunter. And can I say, he and his wife were so accommodating, I just can't say enough about how much I appreciated the time they spent with me. So how do I share crime con with you? Well, I decided to do a top 10 countdown. Yeah, I sort of stole that concept from my friends Wayne and Paul of the Countdown Movie and TV Review Podcast. So this is my Crime Con Top 10 Countdown. These are my 10 best moments and experiences from my time in Indianapolis. It was hard to rank all of this because everything I'm about to share with you was amazing and memorable. After I listen, I'll probably think, oh, number seven really should have been number four, but for now, this is my list. My table on podcast row. Guys, I have to be honest. For two weeks before the event, I was debating whether or not to go to CrimeCon. I know, I know, it sounds crazy. I wasn't thrilled with the organizers for a little while. I didn't love some email responses I received to feedback I shared regarding planning and some last-minute expenses. So it was literally the week of the event when I said, fuck it, some of my podcast besties will be there, I know that some Twisted Philly listeners will be there, and Carl Marino will be there, and I really want to see all of them. When I showed up at Podcast Row with so many bags in tow, I was expecting a bit of a shit show. And there's little old Twisted Philly across from Thinking Sideways, Generation Y, Real Crime Profile, and two women whom I'd never met, Carrie and Caitlin from White Wine True Crime. I had so much traffic, and some of it was spillover from the big boys, who happened to be cool as shit. Especially Steve from Thinking Sideways. He was interesting and funny and chill. Such a down-to-earth guy. 
Oh, and talking to Justin and Aaron from Gen Y was such an effort not to fangirl like an idiot. And then behind me were Tim and Lance from Mara Murray, who were also fun and engaging and approachable guys. Yeah, it was like I won the podcast row lottery. How? I don't know. I think it had to do with an incentive they ran back in 2016, encouraging podcasters to get as many registrants as possible using their discount code. And somehow I came in second in that incentive. And I did pretty well in the next round of registration plugs too. So I guess my disdain before going to CrimeCon was somewhat actually quite a bit minimized when I saw where my table location was. Y'all from Philly, you know we're hustlers, and that's what I did for the last nine months. I hustled to get as many registrations as I could to show the CrimeCon folks that this little niche podcast that isn't all true crime can hang with the big boys. Once I was at CrimeCon hanging with said big boys, I was completely blown away, and back to the table next to me, white wine and true crime, well, that leads to the next item on my countdown. Number nine, Carrie and Caitlin from White Wine and True Crime. There was instant solidarity in the fact we all expected to have a backdrop behind our tables. That wasn't an expectation we had in our heads. It was in the description we received about the event. So I show up with all of these hooks from Target to hang tees, yet there is no backdrop. Caitlin and Carrie had so many awesome photo props and swag and... The three of us looked around, realized the setup wasn't exactly as it had been described, and said, fuck it, let's have a good time. These women are funny and engaging. They were so welcoming and infinitely cool. I definitely felt a little Philly streak in them. It felt like an instant girls' night out, except it was daytime and we weren't drinking. So <laughs> the more we talked, the more we realized we had in common these women were smart, funny, and fabulously dressed, which was way more than I was in a Twisted Philly t-shirt and jeans. If you're not familiar with their show, go to their website because the website is also fabulous. And it will also tell you everything you could possibly want to know about their show and the hosts. Caitlin is a stand-up comedian. Carrie is also a comedian and a writer. Their show is a hilarious mix of true crime education about everything they're watching, plus really cool, interesting special guests. It's a great show, and I adore these women. So that was a lot of day one, although there was something really big that happened on day one, almost immediately after I arrived on Podcast Row, but I'm going to get to that event a little further down the countdown, much closer to number one. It may even be number one. I haven't decided yet, although I probably should because we are already on... Eight. Getting an Uber to take me and Lainey, the host of True Crime Fan Club, to a local liquor store and then paying the Uber driver 20 bucks to stay and wait for us and take us back to the hotel without having to book again or change my destination is definitely my number eight. Meeting Lainey is actually higher up on the list, and I'm going to talk about Lainey again a little further down the countdown. The fact I sent Lainey a text about an hour after getting to Indy and said, hey, feel like hitting a liquor store with me, which sounds more like I'm going to rob a liquor store. And she says, sure, give me 10 minutes. That's a friend. And our first friend outing was buying wine, a bottle of wine that sat in my room unopened the entire weekend. I very seldom drink, and when I do, it's usually a glass of wine for a girl's night out, but I thought, you know, it might be nice to have a bottle of wine in the room in case anybody popped over, I could offer them a drink. I was going to be there for four days, and so I wanted to have something that I could share with other people, which meant I also had to buy a corkscrew because I didn't think to bring one from home. The bottle of Gascon Melbeck Reserve sat unopened and the corkscrew unused, untouched actually, until I was packing and realized I was about to put a corkscrew in my carry-on backpack and then had visions of being taken down by TSA agents, which would have been incredibly unpleasant and embarrassing. Note to self, if I go to CrimeCon next year, do not waste any time or money taking an Uber to her liquor store to have a bottle of wine in the room. Do something fun with Lainey instead of shopping for booze. At the very least, I could have opened the bottle and shared a glass of wine with her once we got back to the hotel, but I didn't think of that until just now. Lainey, I'm sorry I'm such a shitty friend. 
If there's anyone that's listening that doesn't know about Lainey's show, True Crime Fan Club, it's for the ultimate true crime fan. She focuses on cold cases and she doesn't spare the details, but as someone who struggles with the gorier and more disturbing details of true crime, I can tell you Lainey handles these stories with great sensitivity and respect for the victims. So you should definitely check out her show. Seven. I'm going to jump back to my table for a bit because Twisters, in my what won't sound so humble opinion right now, I had the best damn pod swag and I don't care if that makes me sound stuck up, I'm going to own that. The coolest thing about bringing my merch was the other hosts who stopped by to ask who made my designs. I made those designs. Yeah, I'm crafty. Yeah, I like to draw. Yes, I am dangerous with a glue gun, but I had no experience in graphic design until I launched this show. I've been playing with so many design and editing programs in the past year, sometimes I feel like my eyeballs are going to fall out. Having, having someone from Real Crime Profile ask about the artist for my logo and me telling her that it was me, God, that felt good. And it was more than the designs. Those experiences culminated into the realization that I know what I'm doing, even when I don't know what I'm doing. I'm learning as I go, and everything I'm learning, at least I feel, like is making me a better host, a better artist, a better creator, and hopefully a better storyteller. I was really proud of myself at CrimeCon. I was proud that at 47 years old, my life is taking directions I never expected. I'm meeting people and having experiences unlike anything I ever dreamed, and I had a pretty amazing, fulfilling life before launching Twisted Philly. Somehow, it's gotten even better, so yeah, being there, I felt really proud of myself. It should be okay to say that. I am so grateful for the opportunity to be on the same platform as so many people whom I admire. Six. So number six in my top 10 list would have to be James Fitzgerald. James was at the Real Crime Profile table, which was directly across from me. Again, I fucking won Podcast Row Lottery. He was also part of the live show they recorded at CrimeCon. James is a former FBI agent, and he's a Philly boy. He was a police officer in Ben Salem for over 10 years. So James walks over to my table, and I have to say, he's a pretty good-looking guy, a little older, and oh my God, his hair is amazing. He introduces himself, he asks me about my show, and, and I talk to him about Twisted Philly, wondering, okay, this guy sits in on Real Crime Profile on the semi-regular, why is he interested in my show? And that's when he told me his story about being from Philadelphia and living in Jersey now. James has a TV show launching on cable later this summer about his career and his experiences, and he wants to help support my show and would love to come on Twisted Philly, and I was so so excited with the time that I spent chatting with him and the fact that he's interested in coming on Twisted Philly, talking with me, and ultimately talking with all of you. So later this summer, we'll have an episode with James Fitzgerald. And if he's listening, James, thank you. I so enjoyed our conversation, and I can't wait to catch up with you and share a conversation with you sometime later this summer. Five. Okay, we're halfway through the countdown. Things start getting a little heavier going forward at this point. They carry just a little bit more weight when you start to get into the top five. For number five, I would have to say it was the live Q&A that I attended, and there were two of them. The first one was Generation Y, and the second one was Missing Mara Murray. I'm going to talk about Generation Y first. The room was packed, as you would imagine. When Justin and Aaron took the stage, everybody clapped. Everybody in the room was so excited. You could feel the energy of the audience. And then Justin turns to Aaron and says, Hey, Aaron, how you doing tonight? And the room erupted. It was a moment of sheer podcast perfection. I spent money on VIP level tickets, and then we got bumped up to gold VIP, which meant I got to sit in the front row and... 
Yeah, even though I'd been talking to them off and on throughout the event, it just felt so cool to be sitting up in the front row watching Justin and Aaron engage with one another. And it was also surreal seeing them sitting there in front of you when normally you just hear their voices through your earbuds. It was such a great opportunity to learn more about them both, about their show, how they started the podcast. They talked about episodes that were really impactful to each of them and episodes that were difficult. They talked about some things they'd like to do going forward. It was just a great experience to sit and really watch them just be so natural and engaging with one another and with everyone in the audience. If you weren't at CrimeCon and you didn't get to attend that session, I would encourage you to listen to Jeremy's episode on Podcast We Listen To where he interviewed Justin and Aaron because some of what they discussed in their live Q&A is also in that episode. So the second Q&A event I attended was a session with Tim and Lance from Missing Mara Murray, and of course James was there as well. And what was really interesting was there were people in the audience who hadn't heard of this case. They may not have even been aware of the podcast. So it really resonated with me that for as big of a medium as this seems, there's still folks that are just getting exposed to podcasting. They're just getting exposed to some of the stories that hosts like Tim and Lance are telling. It was a great session. I have to say I felt like they were really genuine and authentic. And by that, I mean, they didn't hide the fact that sometimes they don't agree with each other. Um, It was evident in some of the questions that they were answering, the way that their answers varied. They shared a preview of a documentary that's going to be airing about Mara Murray. Um, They're featured in the documentary. James is featured in the documentary, as well as some investigators. And it looks like it's going to be an incredible show. I think if you go to their website, you follow them on social media, I'm sure you'll see more information about that. Again, both of those sessions were just so fantastic to sit and watch these hosts engage and interact with one another and engage with the audience when you're so used to just hearing them in your ears. It just made everything so much more real. And I can't say enough about these guys, all of them, Justin and Aaron from Gen Y, Tim and Lance from Mara Murray. They're just cool dudes. They're easy to talk to. They're totally approachable. They were so engaging with their listeners. You can tell that they're all so grateful for the following that they have. And that was just really beautiful to watch. Okay, we're moving on from number five to... This is my pod family. So I'm not sure if I will be able to get through this section of my countdown without crying a little bit. I've spent nine months getting to know some amazing people, especially some absolutely incredible women. I talk to these women almost every day online, and some relationships have grown more than others, but they're all very special in their own unique way. Lainey was the first pod friend I saw, and I think I may have hugged her a little too tightly. Then we caught up with Nina from Already Gone, who is as beautiful in person as she sounds on her show. Yeah, I've seen lots of pictures of her over the last year, and we even Skyped very early on after I launched Twisted Philly, but meeting her in person was so special. Nina was the first person to help promote my show. She interviewed me on a special series that she has called Women True Crime Broadcast, as in broads because we're women, and I'm so grateful for her friendship and support. I think I drove her a little batty a few weeks ago when I was in my feelings and thought about skipping CrimeCon, but she played it off and was such a good friend. We spent some time with Mike from Pleasing Terrors, and by now most of you should know Pleasing Terrors is one of my absolute most favorite podcasts because, like me, it isn't all true crime. Mike is a master storyteller. Every time I say that, he shuts me down. But Mike, you can't shut me down because I have the microphone. And it's the truth. His voice and cadence draw you in and create an atmosphere like no one else. I love his mix of ghost stories, legends, and lore combined with crime and treachery. Mike has become like the brother I always wanted. Yeah, someone I predominantly talk with online and have only seen once before this weekend when I visited Charleston feels like a brother. That's the power of the podcast community and something I never expected. And I feel like I monopolized a lot of Mike's time in Indy, but it was so good to see him and get FaceTime with one of my favorite people. 
Mike and another friend were the only people who were able to get me stay up late, and that's probably because I was only drinking club soda. Thursday night when we got in, the night before CrimeCon started, Mike and Jeremy from Podcasts We Listen To and me stayed up talking till, I don't know, after 2.30 at the hotel bar. So let me paint the scene for you. The bartender already announced last call at least 30 minutes earlier. They wiped down the bar. They removed all of the empties. They removed the candles and utensil holders. Yet there we sat, ignoring the stink eye they continuously cast in our direction. Can you blame them? The lights were on, for God's sake. None of us took the freaking hint. We were too busy shooting the shit and having fun. Yes, I was spoiled hanging out with two of the best dudes I know. I hadn't met Jeremy before, although like everyone else, we're always chatting in PWLT, and I would say he may be the nicest guy in podcasting. Or maybe a close second to Robin from The Trail Went Cold, who is another unbelievably warm, friendly, and welcoming person. And I'm serious when I tell you it was so hard to act like a calm, rational person when I was meeting these people. Meeting Lisa from Crime and Precedent and her husband was such a delight. She I got to spend time with Heidi from Unsolved. Oh my God, I loved meeting Lindsay and Haley from Curiosity Kills. Damn, I wish I had a chance to spend more time with those two because they are some cool ass broads. They had nipple belts at their table. The pictures that you've probably seen online are nothing. Seeing these nipple belts in person, the craftsmanship that went into making them was truly inspiring and revolting. But I think that's the point. Obviously, I already mentioned I met Justin and Aaron, and I did eventually get over being a little starstruck. I know I keep saying this, but they just seemed like such fun, easygoing, great to talk to guys. And okay, hello, Justin's wife. Oh my God, she is flipping gorgeous. Speaking of gorgeous, Esther from Once Upon a Crime was someone else who I was so excited to meet, and we didn't get to spend quite as much time as I wish we could have spent together because we were all just so swamped. Esther always seemed like such a real, no-bullshit sort of woman, someone who would have your back and also tell you the truth when you need to hear it. She is beautiful. There is this inner beauty that radiates from her, and it matches how beautiful she is on the outside. There were moments when I was in her presence where I felt like I would get lost listening to her talk because it was just like her voice coming through my headphones. I am so thankful I got to meet Esther in person. That beautiful, positive energy she carries around with her really touched me. And she might listen to this and think I'm a freak, but that's how I felt. And I'm so hopeful that she comes out for a visit to Philadelphia because I would love to just spend more time with her. She's an amazing woman. I got to meet Jordan from Thin Air, and I know Daniel was there, but I didn't get a chance to meet him. Or maybe I did, and I didn't know it was Daniel because there were so many people there. Jordan, I wish we could have had the opportunity to spend more time with you. You know I love your show. I think it's the best missing person show, bar none. You and Daniel demonstrate such commitment to your stories. You go so deep with your research, yet you demonstrate such sensitivity and warmth that it doesn't feel like you're just relating someone else's story. And then there were Charlie and Allie. It's unbelievably bizarre to meet people you've Skyped with and already seen face to face a number of times. You've spent hours on Skype talking about kids and family and all sorts of topics that have nothing to do with podcasting. I was so excited, and at the same time, it was so easy because it felt like we'd already met. Especially Allie, because shit, that girl is talking to me either on the phone or on Messenger almost every morning between 5 and 6 a.m. here in the States when I'm getting ready for work, and I don't know what I would do without those early morning check-ins. The experience of meeting my pod family and making new pod friends was amazing. And it's starting to get down to the wire. It's so hard to rank the top five. Depending on my mood, everything keeps shifting rank. But I'm sticking with my list for now, which brings us to... Three. Flat Erica. What very few people know is that Erica, whom I didn't personally know at the time, is the reason I finally launched Twisted Philly. Last year, I'd been laid off from my day job, and I took a few months off to work on my horror novel, 
which is about two podcasters who get caught up in something with someone from a case they cover on their show. It's funny, it's terrifying, it's also got an element of the supernatural, it's filled with fucks, as you would expect, and by God, it will be finished this summer. And it was called Twisted Philly. So when I was writing, I wanted a mixture of true crime Philly stories as well as fiction that I was creating. As I was researching true crime and other Philadelphia stories for the book, I realized I had episodes for a podcast. But I didn't want to do all true crime. So I put the book on pause and I put the podcast on play and I had an outline for about five episodes. Early last summer, I recorded two and I did nothing with them. Not a damn thing. Because I thought, who wants to listen to me talk about Philly? Who wants to hear my Philly accent, which can be hard on the ears? And then last summer, I found Apex and Abyss. And within the first few words, my daughter said, Mama, she's from Philly. Yeah, she was. I knew that accent anywhere. I reached out to Erica on Facebook. I told her how much I liked her show. I told her how I was a little obsessed with the murder of the boy in the box, which was one of the cases she covered. And I'd been talking to law enforcement and some other agencies about the status of that case. And I thought, shit, she's a Philly girl and she's got a great show. Maybe I should get off my ass and release these episodes and see what happens. So I decided to go for it. My buddy Adam sent me an article titled 27 Steps to Getting Your Podcast on iTunes. And believe me, I followed every single one of those 27 steps. I talked to Erica again when I launched my show, and she immediately invited me to join a women's true crime group on Facebook. She invited me in, and she's been doing that ever since. <laughs> I'm crying, but these are happy tears. I feel like she is my little pod sister. I even call her my little pod sister because I'm old enough to be her mom. Okay, her young as shit mom, but I could still be her mother. So fast forward to May of this year, and the idea for Flat Erica was born. As a gag, we talked about Erica traveling to CrimeCon in my suitcase like Flat Stanley. And everyone thought it would be a little flat version of Erica that I could take with me wherever we went and take pictures of her at CrimeCon. Well, that's not the vision I had in my head. What I envisioned was a life-size Erica from Apex and Abyss, a cardboard stand-up with Erica's face and an Apex and Abyss t-shirt standing next to me at my booth on Podcast Row. So that's what I made, and you probably saw the pictures. I carried her around for a full day and a half until Allie from Insight took over on Erica duty. Flat Erica drank, she partied, Two women whom I believe were rather inebriated tried to steal her from me. One woman licked her face for a picture. Yeah, licked her paper face. It was a little terrifying. She hung out at the bar with everyone while I went back to my room because I'm an old head who cannot hang past 11 o'clock at night. She had too many drinks. She hit on too many men and wound up in Mike's closet on Sunday night. Everywhere we went, people wanted to know, who is that? Why do you have a giant paper doll at your table? Nancy Grace came over and said Flat Erica was fabulous. The best part of Flat Erica was a conversation that she and I had Saturday night. Not the Flat Erica, but the real Erica. But that's personal, and I can't share it. What I can share is I love this girl so hard. I love her show. I love her drive and determination as a young professional woman and wife and mother who was taking care of a family and a home and working full time and putting out an amazing show. I will be forever grateful to her for something she didn't even know she'd done until I told her a few months ago. And that was helping me find the courage that I needed to launch Twisted Philly. So Erica, you may have expected a tiny little flat version of yourself like a paper doll, but that simply would not do, my friend. You are larger than life to me, and the 2D version of you needed to stand up and stand out. I loved having you there with me. And I think we should bring flat Erica again next year, even though I'm hoping the 3D Erica will be there too. But yo, my t-shirt that I put on the stand-up, I double-bagged that shit before it went into my suitcase and I've washed it three times since I've been home. Flat Erica must have hugged hundreds of strangers in my shirt and someone spilled beer on you.
This is a close tie for first. The Twisted Philly listeners who were at CrimeCon. Kim and her friends from Lancaster, Courtney and Erica, all of whom joined me on a catacomb tour under the city of Indianapolis, which was unbelievable. It was beautiful and it was spooky. I definitely felt some sort of energy there and it was fantastic to spend a night with really cool people who wanted to spend time with me because they listened to the show. Brittany, who's living in DC but is a Jersey girl and a Philly girl, you made me cry a little bit, Brittany. It's unbelievable to me that someone would be so excited to meet me. Meeting Jen M. Jen, it was like spending time with someone I've known forever. She and her husband shared great stories with me about from where they live and paranormal tales. Meeting Krista, my God, girl, you are gorgeous. You made me cry a little too. You have the best smile. And when your mom told me you were so excited to meet me, I just couldn't believe it. Monica and Phyllis from Delaware County, Delco in the house, hanging with them at the Dweebs meetup and then joining them for dinner, getting to know them and swapping details so we can stay connected back home. Monica, you made me cry too, and you know why, and that's private. I'm not going to share that in this episode, but getting to know her for even just a little bit on a personal level and hearing that listening to me makes her day better. Like, how the fuck does that happen? How is it possible that by telling stories about both the seedier side of this city and the best parts of this city, people feel like I make their day better? I never expected any of that when I started this show. And I talk to these folks almost every day online now, and I don't know what I would do without them. I know there might be a few names I'm missing, and I'm sorry because it was an absolute joy meeting people who listen to Twisted Philly. Meeting people who would take time out of their day when there were so many big names there to see and find me and introduce themselves and say hello. It was truly unexpected and amazing. So unexpected and amazing is the perfect segue to my final moment in my CrimeCon countdown. <laughs> Mr. Carl Marino. If you follow me on Twitter, you know I follow Carl Marino. I'm a big fan of Homicide Hunter, as is my daughter, and Carl Marino plays the role of Lieutenant Joe Kenda in the reenactments. So a few months ago, I tweeted Carl and asked him to come on Twisted Philly. His response, which made total sense, was, let's wait till CrimeCon. So I pushed it a little harder and asked him again to come on the show and then asked him if I could interview him at CrimeCon. And then a bunch of listeners and a bunch of my pod family, including Nina and Charlie, tweeted him asking him, let Dina interview you at CrimeCon. And, you know, he said yes. And I figured, ah, he'll forget about it by the time we get out to Indianapolis. So I get in there on Thursday and I tweet that I'm at CrimeCon. Carl tweets me and says, hey, I'm here looking for you. And I almost fell over because not only did he remember, he was so gracious about his willingness to make time to let me interview him for a little bit to share on my show with all of you. So that's what happened. When I got to my table on Friday when CrimeCon started, within a few minutes, Carl and his beautiful wife stopped by. He was getting ready to go into his session, which was at the same time as Podcast Row. So we agreed to make some time once he was done, and that's exactly what he did. He and his wife came right back to my table when they were done their session. We grabbed a couple of chairs. We sat in the corner of Podcast Row, and Jeremy was kind enough to bring over his portable microphones and help me record my interview with Carl Marino. So I'm going to play that for you now. And what I love about this is that there is background noise in this because it's the convention. It's CrimeCon. Yeah. Hey, Twisters, what up? This is Dina Marie, host of the Twisted Philly podcast, and holy shit, I'm sitting here with Carl Marino, who plays Lieutenant Joe Kenda on Homicide Hunter. 
Carl is such a sweetheart because I probably bugged the hell out of you off and on on Twitter for like six months. Was no, no bugging at all. No bugging? Yeah, it, was, it wasn't a problem. To get a couple of minutes with you while we're here at CrimeCon, with us is Carl's lovely wife. Alona. Yeah. Very nice to meet you. Carl just finished a session. It went pretty well. It did. It went better than expected. It looked like it was incredibly well attended. It, it seemed, you know, we did okay. A yeah. <laughs> couple of questions for you. I know we only have a few minutes. Sure. Did a little bit of homework. You were a deputy sheriff for 17 years. I was. Is that right? Yes. That was where in New York were your sheriff? Uh, Monroe County, uh, Rochester, basically. Okay. What kind of crimes, what kind of issues did you and your, your department have to deal with up there? Well, uh, Rochester is the crime capital of New York State, believe oh, it or not. Because uh, you got to be number one at something, I guess. But yeah. Unfortunately, it was crime, and I work primarily in our maximum security jail. So, so I dealt with everyone. Oh, my goodness. Came in from you know, petty larceny to, to murderers to serial killer. What prompted you to leave that and obviously to take on a new type of career? Um, well, it's. There were a lot of different factors involved. It, it wasn't something that I planned on doing as far as becoming an actor. I kind of fell into that. It was okay. I never had any desire whatsoever. I uh, left the department, moved to California because I had family that lived out there. And fell into the whole acting thing once I, once I got out there. And kind of the right place at the right time. One thing led to another. And now I will be filming our 100th episode in November. Wow, congratulations. Thank That's exciting. Thank you. So you've been on Homicide Hunter since 2011? In 2010 we started filming. 2010? Oh, 2011. Okay. Okay. I should ask her. She, know, knows, she knows better than I do. Women are better with dates, she really aren't is we? Too. Yeah. Yes, we are. That's why I looked at her. <laughs> How often do you, like, what did you do to get ready for that? Did you spend time with Joe Kenda, getting to know him? No, and that's kind of the strange part is I never met Joe Kenda until season three. Get out. Uh, we talked on the phone in season one, okay. emailed back and forth. Um, got a sense of who he was a little bit. Yeah. And having been an officer, I kind of I've had bosses like him, too. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of added a little bit of my own, what I thought that he would have been as your, and I, and I used to ask him, I still ask him questions, it's like, well, what do you think I should do different, and he will never give me advice, because you're doing a great job, which I always appreciate, but, uh, and there's days where he's on set, watching, which is very intimidating, okay. when you know Joe Kenda's watching the monitor while you're portraying him in a very emotional scene. That has scene, to be very intense. But he'll never give any, cri you know, critiques or criticism or anything, which is, I've always appreciated. Well, and I would imagine, too, as an actor, you want to bring your own experience to it right, right? And you've got and some, and you've really got experience at, yeah. as a someone in law enforcement as well so and the first compliment he ever gave me i was asking you how do you think i'm doing he said to me uh, i like the way you pull a gun which nice i thought was the greatest company that's could a give very that cool point. compliment yeah. since you're here with us how when and how did you two meet we actually met on a movie set okay um, she'd worked for bear stearns before the downfall and she stayed on for a long time putting them to sleep and because she did, she was able to get a package and took like a couple years off and decided to do some acting. She'd worked on a movie with a friend who happened to be my co-star on another movie. The last day of filming, we had the bar scene, and uh, he said, hey, why don't you come hang out, be an extra? And so we met that day, and it turned out the very next day we were on a Bollywood film in San Jose, California together. Really? Playing the same characters. We were parents of the kids in this Discovery Museum. So we met down there, we talked nonstop for like 14 hours. And, but you forgot we were filming. <laughs> we thought, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. So we really hit it off, and here we are. Are you a fan of programs on ID? Do you watch no. Homicide Hunter? I watch it religiously. Yeah. Part, <laughs> part of what I said in my session is I didn't understand the true crime genre, how big it was at the time. It was something I didn't really want to be part of because I'd lived it. Of type thing. And I, and I didn't understand how people, I thought they were, I, the quote was like morbid, morbid freaks. Yeah. But then I realized... Uh, you know what, I'm okay with that. But, but, yeah. but they're not. And, and, the first, and, and, I, told, and I told the story in the session, the first time we went to her, to her parents' house in Southern California to meet them, and uh, she took me into her, her childhood room and wanted to show me you know, her possessions and stuff. And the first thing I saw was a wall completely full of well-worn true crime books. Oh, and outstanding. Then, and then she pulled out a full set of serial killer trading cards. So then I had to reevaluate what I thought true crime fans were. <laughs> and the fact that she knew every episode of Forensic Files and watched the ID channel all the time. That's when I, I got an understanding for it. It's like, no, you know, those aren't the morbid freaks that I thought they were. It's the, you know, intelligent, mystery, thrill-seeking people yeah. that enjoy the, you know, everything about I think it helps to keep memories alive, too. There's no doubt. Are there any other projects coming up for you on ID or anywhere else? Well, not per se. I mean, right, right okay. now, I mean, we're filming season seven, episode seven, starting on Monday. So we're kind of right in the middle of it, and that'll go to the end of November. 
and then we'll see what happens from there. It's a hugely popular show. Obviously, so many people are here to see you and excited to see you. For the folks back home that couldn't be here, besides what you already shared, any other nuggets from your panel that you would be willing to share with our listeners back in Philly? Um, I'm not sure as far as what they'd want to know. <laughs> I, well, I appreciate them watching and you know, keep watching. Yeah. Keep contacting ID, tell them you want more. We will. We will you know, that's, for that's sure. What, uh, they do listen. We're very proud of it, the show, and how it's progressed over the years and, and how much better the show's gotten. I mean, we, we get a lot out of a small budget. And, uh, it's incredibly well done. And that's a credit to our, our crew. Our, uh, our DP which comes from uh, New York City, and he comes down and has a, has a new child and has to leave his kid for a week at a time and stuff, wow. too. And, and, he, and he makes the show beautiful, Dan Kelly. And it's, he, he makes me look good, and I was telling him that, too. I was thanking him. Have you ever had an episode that was, you know, kind of difficult for you to get through based on the story or the content? The ones with the kids are always, and they're, they're the tough ones to watch as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the Hank Waller episode where the grandfather went oh, a little, yeah. little crazy from a stroke, killed his daughter, his wife, and his grandson. Yeah. I mean, that was it was hard to shoot the scene with them carrying the child out, even though it's a child actor. And you have to get into the scene to be realistic too, and so that kind of stays with you a little bit afterwards. It's a great episode. I remember that episode, and it was um, it was diff- it was difficult to watch. Sure, I can't imagine. Sure. And it's a, it is a fan favorite, just because. Well, I know you probably have some other things that you're doing while you're here. Could I ask you one tiny little favor? Sure. My daughter is also a huge fan of the show. Would you say hi, Bella, for me? Hi, Bella. All right, that's it. It was lovely meeting you, Carl. Thank you so much for spending time with us, and for um, me. enjoy the rest of the con. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. I definitely got the sense while we were talking that Carl and his wife, Alona, would have given me more time to interview them. But I knew that there were so many other people at CrimeCon that wanted to get pictures with them and meet them and spend a few minutes talking with them. I didn't want to take too much of their time. I cannot thank both of them enough. They were absolutely lovely and warm and endearing. And I felt so comfortable with them, even though I expected to feel like a complete freak fangirl. But somehow I managed to keep it together. I'm so excited for the new season of Homicide Hunter. And I hope you are too. Carl, thank you so much. You were so sweet to say that I wasn't bugging you. I know that I was a little bit, but it was so great meeting you and Alona. I do want to find the movie that the two of you were in together. I spent a little time searching on IMDb, and I think I found the one, and it sounds really interesting, about a married couple who have a suicide pact and party it up and then plan to commit suicide on New Year's Day. Okay, to a lot of people that wouldn't sound like a good movie, but I think that's a very interesting concept. And the movie is called Anjana and Johnny. So if I can find it, I'm going to watch it. And thank you again. It was such a pleasure meeting you both. Well, Twisters, that was my CrimeCon countdown. I know for some of you, what I shared may not have been the most exciting parts of CrimeCon. It may not be exactly what you wanted to hear about the event, but this was my top 10, so too bad. (laughs) These were the 10 best moments for me. If you went to CrimeCon and you want to share your top 10, I would love for you to email me or post it on social media. I promise you my next episode about the bombing of the members of MOVE is going to be up very soon. If you aren't already following me on social media, you can find me on Twitter at Twisted underscore Philly. You can find me on Facebook at The Twisted Philly Podcast. Or you can interact with me and other listeners on Facebook at The Twisted Philly Podcast Discussion Group. I want to thank Emmy Sarah for the music you heard in today's episode. You can find out more about Emmy on her website at emmysarah.com, and you can download her music on iTunes. If you want to support the show, you can find me on Patreon. For just $2 a month, you get exclusive Patreon-only episodes of Twisted Philly Unfiltered, where I basically talk about whatever the hell I want. So it's really not all that different from the regular episodes, except the subject matter is different. The stories there are something you'll never hear on the regular episodes that are released every week. As always, thank you for listening. Ciao for now, Twisters.